Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, James Powditch. G'day, Richard. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. And uh, great to see you there in your studio. Um, your exhibition is The Proposition at Nanda Hobbs in Sydney. Um, and, and all the works in this exhibition relate to the titles of Australian films. So, so what is your relationship with, with film and Australian films in particular? And, what, and why is that so important? Um, look, since I was a kid, I've, I've been obsessed by film. Like when I'm growing up, I thought I'd be a film director by this age, a successful international film <laughs> director. And I went to art school, I did the study film. I failed nearly every other art class, sculpture, painting, drawing, right? Film classes, I did okay. And so I was just always obsessed. So I grew up watching these films or a lot of these early films obsessively on television, pre-videos. So you, you scan your, your, your TV guide looking for, you know, when, you know, Picnic at Hanging Rock would pop up on the television once every six months, like clockwork or whatever. Um, I grew up with them. Film to me informs nearly everything I do. I see everything almost through a, the lens of a, you know, a camera, even when I'm doing my own work or when I'm working or walking around or pretty much everything. So yeah, it's just been a lifelong obsession, which I keep coming back to periodically in work. I often reference it obliquely in things that are with, that have other subject matter, but in this particular occasion, I've come back to direct reference to the films themselves. So tell us about why you've chosen some of the films that you have, and maybe what we can do is, is uh, work through some of uh, the titles and the films that are this body of work. And let's begin with the, uh, with the title of the exhibition, The Proposition. Well, The Proposition, early 2000s Australian film, one of, my, of, the, of, the, of the, the sort of canon of films that I've chosen, um, the bulk of them fall probably back in the 70s and the early 80s, probably in my formative years. So there's less and less films as we progress up to now, but The Proposition struck me at the time. And it just struck me as like an absolutely great Australian Western. We chose it as a title for the exhibition, um, just because it seemed to it seemed to just give a, a lovely sort of subtle, what's the word, ambiguous take mm. on you know what is it, what is this exhibition about? It's a proposition. Let's you, you can choose to look at it in any way, in many ways, if you want. So I might be proposing a particular take on Australian history and film in particular, but it's up to you to go into the works and get your take as well. So what is uh, what is your proposition? in this exhibition, if, if, if there is one? When I was sort of beginning to think about what show I'd like to do next, I, I wanted to go back to film because I haven't done it for a number of years. I've sort of branched out and I wanted to come back specifically to sort of something that really, really I could get my teeth into. And it seemed natural to come back to Australian film and our, our history and how, we, how the films over from the 1970s up to now, I guess, write our story of Australia and who we are. Let's have a look at at the complexity of uh, these works in terms of the layers that they contain. And, and perhaps let's do that by taking one of the works and, and looking at what, as a viewer, you might gradually discover as you, as you get closer and closer to the work. Um, let's have a look at Mad Max, obviously referring to the movie Mad Max. But as you get into the work, you can see, for example, that most of the background appears to be sheets of paper, pages from a book. Um, and just up in one part of the work, you can see actually that this book is about the great crash of 1929. It's a book about economies. So just start to take us into some of those details. What, what were you thinking there? Why, why this book? I'll start by saying that most of the works have book pages in the background, okay? And often the work itself very obliquely or subtly relates to the film. It might be colour, mood or whatever. And in this particular work, as many in this series that I've done at that size, the book pages are backgrounds and they're often the clue into the work. If you see the title and you go, well, how is that? Now, in Mad Max's case, uh, The Great Crash, um, obviously, yes, referencing The Great Depression. Um, and it's alluding to, obviously, Crash. It's a nice title for a film involved with a lot of crashing of vehicles and mayhem. Uh, but also, the economy's crashed, and it, it sort of, it, it also reminded me that Mad Max came out on the back of the global oil crash. Um, 
of the 1970s. So essentially its premise was a, a dystopian post-apocalyptic war where you know, the nations have gone to war for the oil supplies. Um, so that book, book page gives you a link there. It's basically, yeah, about a world economic crash and the consequences of that and then global conflict due to that, um, which Mad Max picked up on. And there's also, um, again, partly obscured, but strongly hinted at, uh, the word, or at least I presume it's the word, future. The work itself, the, 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 the assemblage, if you like, that's floating on the book page is, is, is predominantly black, which I associate with Mad Max with leather and helmets and black motorcycles and Mad Max's black V8 interceptor. Um, so I, I wanted to keep it black. Um, and the, the future, I, I honestly, Richard, can't even remember what the book is. I chopped it up so long ago, but the font, it was a book on, I can't remember what the, the future obviously formed the big part of the title. And I just loved the swish of it, like almost like a Nike tick. So it reminded me of speed. But also in that classic sort of design sense, futuristic, futuristic back in its day, but, mm quite dated now and sort of Mad Max also was futuristic back in its day but is quite dated now if you revisit. Let's run through um, some of the uh, the works and the titles and and just tell us a little briefly about each of them. Um, okay. Storm Boy for example. Storm Boy film really influenced me. I had a budgery guard called Mr Percival when I was young. I think a lot of us did. <laughs> Uh, the work itself, obviously, seascapes, um, also just the, the colour palette of those. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, they're all, um, they're from those old painting books from the 40s and 50s, Learn How to Paint Guides, and they, you know, they'd have the drawing, rough drawing, a better drawing, a bit of paint, and then they'd have the final image. Well, all those down the left are from those old painting books, and then a big, that classic seascape that half of us had hanging in our grandparents' home when we were a kid. The Year My Voice Broke is a film I remember very fondly. Um, again, tell us a little about your work in response. To me, The Year My Voice Broke is like an Australian, a great Australian version, as good as um, The Last Picture Show, Peter Bogdanovich's new early um, black and white 70s film about a decaying American town. Mm. Um, and to me, that kind of, as I said, it was, a, a, it was the Australian sort of iteration of a, of a similar theme. Um, and just a small town and how insular it is and how, how dark it can be or whatever. So the actual little collage that sits in the middle, to my mind, in my mind, sort of echoed an Art Deco film palace, the, the triangular structures of it, made up of elements of an old, of old um, op shop paintings of Australian landscapes and, and bits and pieces. Like, um, you might be able to tell me what the book was I put in the background. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quiz too far. <laughs> it was a book called He and She, I think, and it was about, it was a sort of 1950s or 60s book on how the sexes should relate to each other, and it was very timid in its approach to sex, like the chapter on sex, basically, that you really would come around going, what the hell was that about? So, and that relates to the sexual sort of politics of the, the mm. year and the characters in that film. Uh, you also address uh, a couple of films that look at uh, First Nations interaction with white culture, uh, walkabout and rabbit proof fence. What do we see there? Over the years, I have done a number of works with walkabout as a title or whatever. And in this, in this particular show, it was an obvious um, film to revisit. So effectively that, that, that is from my, my inner city enclave. That is my vision of the Australian landscape out there. So there's not really any any politics in, in that work itself. It's, it's, a, it's a visual, a fairly simple la abstract landscape. Rabbit Proof Fence, great film, noise film, early 2000s again, one of the greats, I think. Um, the background is of, of, of houses for sale in remote areas and land for sale on the edge of Sydney. So it, it alludes in that sense quite, you know, not particularly subtly to dispossession and the fact that, you know, this land is no longer Indigenous land. It has been broken up and sold for, 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 for us. And also in there, Richard, you'll see that there's a penny, which is photocopied from an original 1962 penny onto the same paper that forms the background. 1962, of course, was the year that the Indigenous, Indigenous people were given the right to vote in Australia. So I thought, again, maybe not too subtle. It's like, you know, we've taken your land, we're chopping it up, we're selling it, but hey, here's a consolation prize, you can vote. So it was kind of, I guess, a bit narky in that respect. There are um, overall perhaps some 
fairly dark visions in many of the films that uh, that you quote in the exhibition. Um, and let's uh, finish with a, a specific example while we're looking at the specific works, The Devil's Playground, which you've represented uh, a, as a fairly threatening Rorschach uh, structure. Give us a sense there uh, of what's going on. Okay, the book pages that form the big grid of that one, because it's a larger work, are uh, essentially a, it's a book on psychology. Uh, yes, you're right, the Rorschach, so it's made up of little Australian plastic maps chopped up into the Rorschach sort of film frame reference again on the left, and then the bigger version, which is, again, yes, quite threatening. I mean, this one relates back to Indigenous relations in this country as well. It's like a, a very, it's, it's quite a schizophrenic relationship that we have with the Indigenous people. So it, that was the idea of the Rorschach. It was meant to be threatening. It was also at one stage called Terra, as in T-E-R-R-O-R, Nullius. But it was definitely meant to feel threatening, like a sort of giant crab-like creature. Yeah, you know, it's sort yeah, of the, and the yin and yang of Australia, beautiful Australia, but combined, you know, black Australia with white Australia, that can be, it's diabolically difficult and, and, and can be very dark. So there is, uh a lot of really very strong messaging and, and from you very strongly felt messaging in many of these works. Can you give us a sense of how you developed over, over now many years this, this mode of work to produce things with so many layers, so much subtlety often, um, and yet clearly also so much structure? As a kid growing up, I think I was just absolutely bombarded and absorbed film, like I, I said. I mean, I, I, if, I, if I was a kid now, I would not leave my room. I'd be watching streaming films 24-7, right? It'd be the end of me. I probably wouldn't be an artist, right? Um, but I was also a kid who was very obsessed with order. Um, I mean, just a little, very short bit of background. I grew up with a single mother. We moved a lot and I had to create order in my life, in my bedroom, making things orderly, putting my books together, you know, to create a sense of safety, a, a, a sense of, you know, that I'm in control, so to speak, before the next move would happen. Um, so I've always been an extremely ordered kid and I've always, you know, was heavily into things like a lot of kids were Lego and things where, but it was very, very precise. That's where my sense of order comes. It's a, it's a sense of control. It's a, you know, vaguely OCD, you know, I'll line the shoes up at home. Um, and it's often under um, in stressful moments. Now, when I'm making artwork, I'm not stressed, but that sense of order and having to have things precisely placed comes together. And then add to that sort of upbringing, I also went into set building and carpentry at a quite young age in my early 20s and spent many, many years doing that. So I was taught, you know, good, um, good skills. Um, which then goes into the work itself. So things, uh, I would love to loosen up, Richard, seriously, sometimes I, I'm so ordered, like my partner will say, geez, just loosen up a bit. Everything doesn't have to be like this, right? But I can't, I, I, I might lay something out and it'll be a bit piggledy-piggledy and then eventually, slowly but surely, everything gets chopped and perfectly fits and ends up like this little immaculate jigsaw puzzle, which, yes, has multiple reigning. I mean, a lot of it's in my head. Right, as you as you're probably getting, and and is not necessarily obvious to the um, to the to the person viewing the work. Do you enjoy the practicality of putting these things together because it's very oh, detailed? I love, I love the work. I mean, my studio you can see some of it. It's set up. It's essentially a small carpentry workshop. So I've got a long bench saw where I can cut timber, a table saw, lots of power tools. It's essentially a you know if I was making furniture, I'd have exactly the same setup. I'm sitting on the end of my big three metre long hardwood bench where I lay work out. Um, the process, it's, process itself, I love. I love, look, like, any, like a lot of people, writers, I imagine artists, many other artists, I, the only part I don't like is when I don't have an idea, when I don't have a hook or a way into work and I'm pacing around this room just and grabbing things, looking at the same things over and over again. What could I add meaning to that? What could I do? If I put that with that, can I create meaning? That's, and if that goes on too long, that's not enjoyable. It's okay for a while, right? But if it goes on for too long and you're seriously banging your head against the wall, but once I start, the process is, I love it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's like being a kid all over again, putting Lego together. All I'm doing is I, I make my own Lego pieces and put them together and try to add meaning and, and essentially in the end, try to create something that aesthetically, from my point of view at least, is 
sounds so naff, but it's appealing, right? It, it just appeals to me. I go, I like that. There's something about it I, I like. It just feels good. Some of the specific works in the, in the exhibition uh, reference particular other artists. I think one refers to Sidney Nolan. There's another that references Modrian. Um, but overall, there also seems to be a, a sense of connection with um, perhaps works like Rosalie Gascoigne's works or, or uh, Joseph Cornell's works. Where do you see these works sitting in the art traditions? Look, that's, it's quite interesting. And Rosalie Gascoigne, I might start with her. When I first started exhibiting in the late 90s, in my first few shows that I had, it, it, um, you know, with a friend of mine, a painter at Tap Gallery in Sydney before commercial exhibition, um, I, very early on the interview, I said that I failed all art, everything at, at art school apart from film class or whatever. I, I actually did, was unaware of Rosalie Gascoigne when I started putting things together. Um, the artist that I knew was Joseph Cornell, or just somebody that I remember from my youth and, and, and coming across. Um, this is not in no way to put down Rosalie Gascoigne, but it's just interesting. A lot of a lot of comparisons are often because of the found objects. There's not many of us out there, Richard. And if I use a bit of fluoro sign in it, you know, like my art gallery mask here, right? You know, everybody got Rosalie Gascoigne. So subsequently I never use it in my work. Um, but the people, like I grew up, my father was a good friend of Robert Clipple. So Robert Clipple, for my mind, was a, a very a big influence. And I think that shows in the meticulous and sometimes very small components of the work. Joseph Cornell, definitely the American assemblage artist, the juxtaposition of odd things, creating sort of surrealistic connections. And, um, and then the other ones for me that having, like I said, being a shocking student, um, Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, that's sort of the rougher American pop artists of the 60s and, you know, 70s. Richard Diebenkorn is, if I pulled up a painter, I adore his work um, just because of the, and this is something I think I do try to do in my work quite a lot. I like to have empty space. I like to have bits and then space that allows those bits to breathe. And Richard Diebenkorn was a master of that in his big ocean park pictures. Mondrian, you know, that work, it just, the work you're talking about in particular, it just had such a rigid, you know, his, what was it, jazz, his jazz painting, just that rigid line work. So that's where that, and the colour. You are uh, once again a finalist uh, this year, 2021, in the Archibald Prize, uh, this time with a, a portrait of uh, Kerry O'Brien, the ABC uh, current affairs host and journalist. Um, how do you approach the, the process of creating portraits uh, using the type of methodologies that we've been talking about? I think portraiture for me is something I sort of branch out. It, it's, it's, it's obviously quite, quite different to all the works that you can see behind me um, and the works that you might show on screen. So portraiture, I essentially adapted my process many years ago. I cannot tell a lie, Richard. I've relied very heavily, exclusively on photography um, to get the images. Um, but I generally collage a background. Kerry's portrait with all the old newspaper clippings and things was very dense collage wise. Sometimes I'll just put blank pages down and then paint over the top and then I'll paint the image over the top, um, just leaving the positive spaces unpainted. It, it, I'm after something very specific. Again, it gets a bit like we were talking about when I create my own internal narrative. With Kerry, I created a whole world, you know, of what, you know, to, to get that work off. And when I went up to meet him and get the photographs and continue our very endless long conversations <laughs> about late events in history or whatever, I knew what I wanted. The same with Anthony Albanese last year. To my mind, Unlike, I wasn't making a film, but I was creating an album last year. So the whole album in my head had a backstory. It was Anthony Albanese as a young man, as a, you know, sort of indie artist, you know, recording a, an album in his lounge room in Marrickville. And, you know, like there's a whole story he doesn't know about, no one else knows about, but it's in my head. Uh, that's me. I'm a, 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 like a lot of artists, I think we're quite obsessive. And once you go down the rabbit hole of sort of like, that's it, tunnel vision, it's like, that's it. That's all that exists for those, you know, I mean, those works take me maybe, Kerry in particular, with the collage, takes maybe two weeks to make, to collage paint, all right? But the thought process that goes into it is, is maybe a little more extensive than it is, is healthy. Well, it has been fascinating to see how all of those layers of meaning come together in the works we've talked about today. So, James Powditch, thanks very much for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you, Richard. It was an absolute pleasure. <laughs>